I really want to make this point about taking a moment to listen to God in these kinds of situations before you snap off a decision and say something. Is everybody understanding me? So, good, three people understood me. Well, <laughs> I guess that's why I need to stick with it a while. Does anybody understand what I'm saying? All right, thank you. How many of you have a pretty quick answer for things? You're not the type who takes time to think, you know, you're just like, I mean, I can answer you before you quit talking, you know. I've already decided after three words that I've got it all done and I can't hardly wait for you to quit so I can give you my brilliant answer. John chapter 5, verse 30, I think is a wonderful scripture. This should be one of our life scriptures. This is Jesus himself talking. I am able to do nothing from myself independently of my own accord. Jesus said he couldn't do anything by himself independently. But only as I'm taught by God and as I get his orders. Even as I hear, I judge. I decide as I'm bidden to decide. As the voice comes to me, so I give a decision. And my judgment is right. It's just and it's righteous because I do not seek or consult my own will. I have no desire to do what is pleasing to myself, my own aim, my own purpose, but only the will and the pleasure of the Father who sent me. Wow. Wow. You have to read that about 25 times before it begins to sink in on you. He said, I don't, I don't do anything by myself. And I certainly don't judge anybody else or make a decision or have an opinion without going to God and hearing what he has to say. And so he said, even if I do judge a situation or when I need to, it's definitely accurate because I didn't make the decision by myself. I let God speak to my heart. I can tell you there would be a lot of things that we would not say if we would just wait a moment to see if we have peace about saying it. There would be a lot of tales that we wouldn't tell, a lot of gossip that we wouldn't do, a lot of telling other people's secrets that we wouldn't do, a lot of opinions that we give that we wouldn't need to give if we would just slow down just a little bit. And try to learn how to live in God's rhythm. God's got a rhythm. And it's not this hurry up, fast paced, crazy way that we live. We get ourselves so stressed out by the time we get out of the house, it's no wonder that we're barking at people all day. <laughs> all right, now. Couple stories. I started to try to find a couple stories on the internet you know, they got good stories on the internet about just about everything. And then I thought, I don't need to do that because I got my own life. <laughs> Jesus had to tell parables, but I've never had to tell one yet. I've never had to make up a story because I've never had any, anything that I preached on that I didn't have something in my own life. And I'm hoping and praying and believing that since this is what God put on my heart, that this is going to begin to make you more aware of this sin because that's what it is and it is birthed out of pride and I do believe that God just despises pride. More than anything he wants us to be totally dependent on him and to know that we're nothing without him and to not ever think that anything good that we do is of us but it's always and only because his goodness is working through us. The good things that we do, the things we're good at are gifts from God. They're not things that we own or have or have mastered. And we're very bad when we're really good at something about judging other people who aren't good at that. I had a home Bible study. That's how my ministry started. I did a couple little home Bible studies. And um, had about 25 people in each one. And one of the girls that was coming on a regular basis was married and she got pregnant while she was coming. And when she... When she got pregnant, she started feeling bad all the time, and she was sick a lot, and so she wasn't coming very regularly. She had a lot of problems in her life, and, you know, of course, me and some of my other girlfriends thought that she should be there, and so we began to, to talk, well, it's a shame that she doesn't just discipline herself to come because she really needs to be here, and 
you know, she just gives in to things too easy and, you know, wow, well, she really, she, you know, she's going to be sorry she didn't come. You know, her life's just going to stay in a mess and uh, so went on. You know, so often we say things and we don't even realize what we are doing. We are so busy running our mouths that we don't even realize what we're doing. And so I had three children then and as far as I knew then, wasn't going to have any more. But a couple of years later, God started giving me a desire to have another, another baby. And our youngest one was 10 then and so Dave thought I was a little bit daffy, you know. <laughs> you want to do what? And, uh, but I really felt strongly about it and, you know, he, Dave's a real agreeable guy. He was like, okay, you know, so. And I'm glad we had that baby because now he's the CEO of the stateside portion of Joyce Meyer Ministries. And uh, one of our sons runs the world missions and the other one's over all the media outreach and everything that goes on at the office. And um, so I got pregnant with him and every other time I'd been pregnant, I felt great. I just, I was a, I felt good when I was pregnant. I just, I'd be a little bit tired for a few weeks and after that, everything was fine. Well, when I got pregnant this time, I was so sick <laughs> that I could not even hardly get my head up off the couch. And I mean, I only did what I absolutely had to do and this was going on now three months, this is going on. And David would be out in the backyard playing ball with the kids and they'd all be having fun and I'm laying on the couch just going, oh my God, what is wrong with me? And the first three times, I didn't even know to pray about stuff like that. I just got pregnant and felt good and went on. Well, this time, woman of faith and power, man, I'm believing God <laughs> for a healthy pregnancy and an easy birth and, you know, all these things. Well, the birth wasn't easy either because he lacked one ounce weighing 10 pounds and we didn't do the epidurals back then either, ladies. <laughs> we had babies with nothing. And uh, so I was sick, 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 sick. So I'm praying, God, what is wrong? What is wrong? What is wrong? Well, I kept being, being led to Matthew 7. Let's go to Matthew 7. See what it says. And I can't even tell you how many times I read Matthew 7 and I just wasn't getting it. Do not judge and criticize and condemn others. <laughs> now this happened to me 31 years ago, this happened to me. Do not judge and criticize and condemn others so that you may not be judged and criticized and condemned yourselves. For just as you judge and criticize and condemn others, you will be judged and criticized and condemned. And in accordance with the measure you use when you deal out to others, it will be dealt out again to you. <laughs> God, I'm wanting to know what's wrong. Why do you keep leading me here? <laughs> I want to know why I'm sick, why I feel bad. I, you know, I don't understand. I'm, I'm exercising my faith and what's wrong? I mean, this went on for a couple days. You know, it's amazing sometimes how, how slow we are to get it when God's trying to speak to us. And uh, so we're going to read the rest of this in a minute, but it was like all of a sudden God brought that girl to my mind and I heard everything <laughs> that me and these other women had said. And uh, there's a part of this verse, verse 6, it says, Do not give that which is holy, the sacred things, to the dogs, and do not throw your pearls before hogs, lest they trample upon them with their feet and turn and tear you in pieces. Well, I personally believe, and I can only do the short version of this, but I personally believe that the pearls that we have, the holy thing that we have is the ability to love people. And so when we, when we don't love people, it's just like throwing that out in front of the enemy for him to trample all over. And then the Bible says that, that then the enemy turns and tears us in pieces. Love protects us from the devil. I mean, love is the highest form of spiritual warfare that anybody can do. I mean, literally the highest form of spiritual warfare that anyone can do is to love people. Well, you know, I was a Christian. If you would ask me, do you love people? I would have said, yes, I love people. But love to me back then was just a bunch of talk and a sermon and a, 
and a theory and an idea and, and an occasional hug. I didn't, it wasn't in the practical areas of my life. And if, if we would have loved that girl, what we would have done would have been offered to help her. There was enough of us that we could have said, hey, we want you to be able to come to the meeting. We know you need to be there. So, you know, we've kind of pooled our resources and we're going to, you know, a couple of people are going to come by each week and help you get your house cleaned up and help you do some of the things, you know, I'll do your grocery shopping, whatever. And if we would have done that, I can guarantee you that I wouldn't have been sick the first three months <laughs> of my pregnancy. Come on now. And I just wonder how many problems we have in our life. I mean, I seriously wonder how many problems we have in our life and we just don't connect the dots. We are clueless. We don't have a clue. God is showing us clues, but clueless people don't get the clue. <laughs> they just go on and do the same thing again and again and again. If you have a problem in your life that you're dealing with and you're not being able to get rid of it, you might want to humble yourself enough to ask God, is there something here that I need to see that maybe I need to repent over? And I'm not telling you that every problem you get is because you've judged somebody. That's, that's foolishness. I would never say that. But I'm telling you my story of how God began. It wasn't the end of it, sad to say. But how he began to teach me the dangers of judging other people. You see, I have no right to stand up here or sit up here or be on that television teaching anybody anything that I have not had some personal revelation on. I think that that's what, I think that that's what makes a word anointed when, when you really understand it and you know what you're talking about. And I can tell you that judging other people is extremely dangerous. And it's not something that we should look lightly at anymore or have a light attitude about all of our opinions that we have. We really need to ask God to help us walk in more love in our, our attitudes and opinions toward people. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now I'm going to read this to you out of the Message Bible just because I think it's funny. <laughs> and it gets the point even stronger. So we're going to put up Matthew 7. Don't pick on people, jump on their failures, criticize their faults, unless of course you want the same treatment. <laughs> that critical spirit has a way of boomeranging. It's easy to see a smudge on your neighbor's face and be oblivious to the ugly sneer on your own. <laughs> Do you have the nerve to say, let me wash your face for you when your own face is distorted by contempt? It's this whole traveling roadshow mentality all over again. <laughs> Playing a holier than thou part instead of just living your part. Wipe that ugly sneer off your own face <laughs> and you might be fit to offer a washcloth to your neighbor. See, what the, the message here really, if you study it out and, and you use that whole example, one of the translations say, don't try to get the tiny speck out of your brother's eye when you've got a telephone pole in your own eye. And then it basically goes on to say, because you can't do it right. You know, if you're looking at other people and not even looking at yourself, then there's no way that you can properly, lovingly, in a godly way, bring correction to anybody. And once again, I'm not saying that we ignore bad behavior. What I'm saying is you can't judge the person's heart because it's before God that they will stand or fall. But there are times when we will be called upon by God to bring a word of correction in the right way. But if you have a telephone pole in your own eye, just imagine it. I don't have one up here, but use your holy imagination. If I have a telephone pole jetting out of my eye and here I come at you to try to get the speck out of your eye, we all know what's going to happen. I am going to beat you up badly with my telephone pole. <laughs> you are going to be one bruised, beat up, bloody mess when I'm done with you. And sad to say, that's what usually happens when a self-righteous Christian gets done with some... <laughs> Amen? 
I mean, that's not the way that we want to be. If any one of us would stop for one second and think what God has forgiven us for, oh my goodness. My second story. <laughs> now, one time I had something to say about a preacher after we'd been to one of his services about his teaching. And I said, you know, that guy, he just gets off on all these rabbit tracks and never brings anything back to finish, and it's just confusing. He'd be good if he'd just stick with something. <laughs> that was all I said. Forgot all about that. You know, we say stuff, forget all about it, just a comment, just our opinion. <laughs> Go on. So then I, I started when I was trying to preach, I just felt like there was absolutely no anointing. And, you know, preaching is usually really easy for me. It's like, it, I mean, it's a gift. I've never learned how to do it, studied how to do it, went to school for how to do it. I just have a gift in communication. And so I don't, I don't work at it. I don't struggle with it. It's not a strain for me to come up with anything to say. So when I'm preaching and I'm looking at my watch wishing it was over, <laughs> I know that there is a problem. And so I had like two or three weeks of that. You know, and I was doing a couple of meetings a week back then. I was doing much smaller meetings than this. Obviously, I wasn't on television yet. But, you know, we always want God to promote us. But every time that we want to come up higher, a little bit more of our flesh is going to have to go down lower. And I had a big vision to do great things and preach the gospel all over the world. I just, I was so full of desire to share the word with people. And it was a desire that God put in my heart. But he had to teach me some really hard lessons before I could be in the place that I'm in today. And I just beg you, when God's trying to deal with you about something, don't just blow it off. Learn what he's trying to show you. Because God just has so much more for us than what we ever experience because of all the just the silly things that we do don't bear any good fruit. I mean, what good does it do us to have an opinion about somebody else and then talk about it? I mean, it does not do one bit of good. Not one thimble full of good does it do. So why is it so important for us to tell everybody what we think when most of the time what we think is based on no knowledge at all? <laughs> hmm. I hope you guys are still capable of driving when you leave here. I'm kind of going after it tonight. <laughs> you like this? Is helping anybody? Yeah. Right. Okay. And if you're thinking about turning that television off, don't. Because <laughs> you need to hear this too. So, after about three weeks of this, I came home and I'm telling David, I do not know what in the world is wrong with me, but I just feel like I have, do not have any anointing to preach at all. And he said, well, you know, you, you can't tell it. Your preaching's fine, but I knew. And so I, I told him, I said, I am going in my office. I'm not going to bed tonight till I get an answer from God. So I went in there, Dave went to bed, and I'm trying to get an answer from God. Nothing, 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 nothing. The next morning, Dave comes to me and he said, I think I know what's wrong with you. Well, right away, I'm like, oh, yeah, you know what's wrong with me, all right. You know, well, what about you? You got plenty of stuff wrong with you, too. And, <laughs> you know, I wanted to hear from God. I didn't want to hear from Dave. <laughs> Anybody know what I'm talking about? <laughs> but it so happens that God was after me and he was after that pride factor. So he didn't tell me what was wrong. He told Dave because in order then to receive the correction, I had to go even lower. <laughs> I mean, I wanted to be able to say, God spoke to me. <laughs> and now I know the problem is. And I would have kept it between me and God and never told Dave anything about it. 
But as it was, God didn't tell me. He told him. So I finally, I'm like, okay, what's wrong? He said, well, you know, a couple weeks ago when we left so-and-so's church and you, you said some things about his preaching that you thought he was kind of disjointed and all over the place. And I said, yeah. He said, well, I think God showed me that's what the problem is, that you shouldn't have done that. I said, well, you agreed with me. <laughs> and you know what he said? I'm not having a problem. And then Dave kind of pulled one of those writing on the finger floor with your finger things. Because this is what he said. He said, listen, I'm just telling you what God said. <laughs> Whatever you want to do with it is up to you. And he left the room. And there I'm standing there like the Pharisees. Who's going to throw the first stone? Now, if he would have started an argument with me, I would have lost the weight of that moment. Come on, I want you to get this. I'm telling you, we say too much. We don't give God any room to work. We're trying to convince everybody what's wrong with them. And we need to let God do the convincing. Come on. This may help get some problems straightened out in your life. I mean, I have women write me all the time. I cannot communicate with my husband. We can't talk about anything. What's wrong? What's wrong? Well, you know, it may be that you just say too much a lot of times. <laughs> now I got men out there thanking me. <laughs> well, sometimes you guys say too much too. It ain't all about the women. Yeah, come on, ladies, clap, cheer, woo! All right, so, Dave left. There was nobody there left for me to deal with but God, so I go into my office, and I'm like, okay, all right. So I start looking, you know, in the Bible for something that's going to help me. <laughs> So, I'm already in the coffin, now here comes the nails. <laughs> James 3, 1. Not many of you should become teachers, self-constituted, sensitive reprovers of others, my brethren, for you know that we teachers will be judged by a higher standard and with greater severity than other people. Thus, we assume the greater accountability and the more condemnation. So, God didn't have to deal with Dave. Because even though Dave agreed with me, he wasn't the one standing up in front of people teaching. So I want you to listen to this. All judgment is very dangerous, but I think one of the most dangerous things you can do is judge somebody who is in the same profession that you are, or who is exercising the same gift that you are, because I obviously was saying, without saying it, that he doesn't teach as good as I do. I, of course, stay on target and don't run down all these. I mean, I got, I got so lost in one of my stories two weeks ago in Hershey, Pennsylvania, I had to stop and ask the crowd what I was talking about. <laughs> so I definitely get out on these rabbit tracks. I am usually pretty good about getting it all back and bringing it to a finish. But the whole point that God was trying to make was... If you want me to use you and anoint you to speak my word to people, then don't you dare judge another teacher. We shouldn't be judging anybody, but it's especially haughty and prideful when we're judging somebody who's doing the same thing that we're doing. Well, I want to encourage you to pray and ask God to teach you how to walk in more love. The Apostle Paul prayed for the church, and he said, I pray that you would abound in love. That means that it would grow by leaps and bounds. Treating people right, treating them the way we would want to be treated, is actually love, and it's one of the highest forms of spiritual warfare that we can do. 
So if you really want to walk in power over the enemy and not let him rule your life, one of the ways you can do it is just to walk in more love. I believe that we need to focus on having a good, strong love walk. Nancy is two years old, but when she was about three months old, something fell on her head and, and the injury basically stunted all of her development and her growth from that point forward. And so she hasn't really been able to, to develop like a normal child since that time. But because of our medical clinics here, she's come back the last two days and they've been able to, to get her the medicines that she needs. They've been able to teach the family how to work with uh, Nancy on, on physical therapy and how to, to, to teach her and train her so that there's a very, very good chance that with these medicines and with you know, the physical therapy that she'll walk someday and that she'll be able to overcome this injury. Nancy's parents have brought her two days in a row because they love her so much and they want her to get the help she needs. On their behalf, as a parent, we just thank you that we can come and help beautiful children like Nancy. Hi, sweetie. You are a beautiful girl. Yes, you are.